Welcome to Galaxy Brains, the weekly podcast from Galaxy Research. I'm back with another rap. This year was berserk. It's our last pod, but have no fear. The whole team is here. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next year. As always, I'm your host, Alex Thorne, head of Firmwide Research at Galaxy Digital. And like I said, we this is our last podcast of the year. We have a crazy roundtable. We have six guests, all of whom you've met before on Galaxy Brains. We're going to talk with Tyler Williams, Bimnet Abibi, Christine Kim, Saul Kadir, Walt Smith, and Charles Yu about policy, Bitcoin, Ethereum, NFTs, DeFi, stable coins, roll-ups, uh, a lot more. And so it's going to be a fun one. But, um, you know, I do have to tell you to look at the link to the disclaimer on the podcast notes and note that none of the information in this podcast constitutes investment advice or an offer, recommendation, or solicitation by Galaxy Digital or any of its affiliates to buy or sell any securities. Um, we got that disclaimer out of the way, so let's get right into it. All right, before we get into it um, with some of our guests, I'm going to talk a little bit about Bitcoin and the year that we've had. I think there's a couple big stories in Bitcoin. Specifically, first, I would say the biggest story is the mining industry um, absolutely ballooned and came on shore to the U.S. in 2021 um, following the the uh, growing access to U.S. public markets, but also the um, the banning of Bitcoin mining in China um, led to a lot of capital raising and debt raising by publicly listed U.S. miners, um, many of whom have found themselves struggling in 2022. Um, I think that's one of the biggest stories. We haven't seen hash rate really come down a lot. Um, in fact, difficulty is still up sort of near all-time highs. Um, but I think we have to expect that we will see some reduction uh, and we'll certainly see more consolidation in the mining space. We'll talk more about that, of course, with our friends from Galaxy Digital Mining. Um, and as always, by the way, I should tell you, there'll be an, a, a sort of an end of year mining report from the, that awesome team. Um, they've put one out about, I think, every six months or so for several years now, and they're excellent. So you'll get more details on that. I think another big story for Bitcoin is just the sort of separation and differentiation from the other cryptos. I think um, that's, I think, been true in general. You know, Bitcoin's always sort of stood alone. It's the oldest. It's the first. It's the most valuable. It's all of that remains true. Um, but for example, with Ethereum moving from proof of uh, work to proof of stake with the merge, I think you know that leaves Bitcoin as the only major crypto asset uh, or cryptocurrency that is uh, uses proof of work, which is a major differentiator. I think there's, I'm personally a you know big supporter of proof of work, and so I think, but but also in other ways, right? Bitcoin, it never built, it doesn't have the sort of um, you know robust on chain um, programmability that say something like Ethereum does. Which you know I is is I think a positive for Bitcoin. I don't uh, and and it also means though that the hacks that we see on chain, the the you know rise and fall of these various you know on chain markets like Bitcoin is pretty insulated from that. Um, when you look at the sort of um, the failure of many centralized uh, intermediaries in this ecosystem over the last year, Bitcoin unaffected by that. Um, ex, you know except for the extent to those that those intermediaries own Bitcoin um, or used it. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, the story for Bitcoin is that it keeps working. Um, I will say there's another uh, another story is that in the in the face of inflation, uh, literally consumer price increases, um, Bitcoin did not act as an inflation hedge. But I, I've argued in the past, and I believe this, and I think if you went back and checked my record, you wouldn't find me calling it a, a hedge on price inflation. Um, I think the idea is that it's a hedge on the monopoly of money creation by central banks um, and, and and perhaps even um, a vote on the credibility of central banking. And the reality is with central banks tightening dramatically and increasing the cost of money, um, which is a big you know pivot from where we were in 2020 when um, banks were dramatically increasing uh, the supply of money, um, you could you could say central banks have become more credible, and thus you know it makes sense that Bitcoin um, isn't you know that 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 hedge against central banks is you know playing out against Bitcoin's price. Obviously, I think though the bigger story for Bitcoin price is the the story for all risk assets, which came off one of the largest bubbles in risk assets in history, uh, which you know began to crack and pop at the end of 2021, and of course Bitcoin has 
uh, not been spared from a drawdown across all risk. Um, so, I, you know, but there's also great developments happening in Lightning. Um, you know, we haven't really seen a large adoption of Taproot yet, but that's a powerful upgrade that could, um, you know, could see interesting new things built. Um, there were discussions this year in the development community around covenants and, and privacy and, and you know, now talking about replaced by fee. Um, and, you know, Bitcoin just keeps working. I'm pretty bullish on, on the long term uh, prospects for Bitcoin, as I don't think that will surprise anyone. Um, but it's going to be an interesting year. I think with Bitcoin now as the only proof of work cryptocurrency that matters um, and, and also not sort of playing this development game that really all the other chains are sort of forced to do, which is sort of one-upping each other or adding new tech development on a regular basis, lest they be um, obsoleted by some new entrant. Um, Bitcoin really remains uh, quite different <laughs> than the rest of the crypto ecosystem, uh, which I think is a big positive for Bitcoin. So um, that's all I'll say on Bitcoin for now. Let's get into it with our first guest. Bimnet Abibi, our friend from Galaxy Digital Trading. Great to have you as always. How are you doing? Doing great. Yeah. How are you doing? I'm great too. I'm excited. Beautiful. This is our year end episode. I'm so pumped. Um, we, you got a lot of fans out there in podcast land. Um, and normally we sort of keep it a bit tight, right? We say like, what happened last week? Yeah. What did Jay Powell say today, et cetera. But I'm thinking more. Uh, I'd love it, it, <laughs> when you look back at this crazy year 2022 in markets, not just crypto, of course, but in macro and everywhere else. Um, I don't know what's your what's your big takeaway. I don't know how to ask this question, but like 2022, speak. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, this year I would say that the, the the biggest thing that happened was the cracking of, of of the bond market. Basically, the the massive shift that you've had from you know super easy monetary policy to the complete opposite. I mean, before this year, you were in a 30, 40 year bull market in in bonds. Mm. And the whole world is long bonds like, like like crazy, and all of a sudden the Fed jacked up rates to four, five percent, um, and that had a huge impact on on basically everything. The dollar went crazy. Um, you had things like the pound crashing, mm -hmm. right? Um, dollar yen like forcing a Bank of Japan intervention in their currency market, not just once but twice. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's been a year that I would say where everybody had to reconsider basically every investment on the planet because the opportunity cost of money went sky high. Every investment has to be pegged to interest rates. And when interest rates are 4 or 5%, that means those projects need to be earning a lot more. Mm -hmm. And so what higher interest rates have caused is just a recalibration of every investment um, to account for you know the opportunity cost of money, and that's been pretty transformational. Yeah. Um, the other big thing um, was was just the idea of like you know hard assets um, and commodities, right? Like when you're at war, you really care about getting food. Yeah. And like and oil and oil yeah. and like minor disruptions and this causes you know huge delays in semiconductors. And so, you know, I think, you know, given the, the Russia Crimea stuff and, and kind of the, the huge moves you had in commodities, I think a lot of investors, you know, have uh, a newfound appreciation for commodities and, and real world assets. I mean, just think about it. All of the guys that were about e ESG investing this year got wrecked. Um, if you weren't in energy because you were like, it's, it's bad for the environment, well, that meant your, your returns were lower. Yeah. Um, but moving on, um, so you had that sort of uh, U.S. jacking up rates. They lead the way. The U.S. central bank always leads others, and that basically caused everyone from the Canadians, New Zealands, EM countries, they all started jacking up their rates. And if they didn't, their currency was going to collapse. And you finally, the, the last straw or the last thing to drop was, was the Bank of Japan, and they just did it yesterday. <laughs> Literally, ju just to beat the year-end mark, they adjusted their yield curve control policy um, from 25 basis point cap on 10s to, to 50. It was the first sort of hawkish shift you had in the BOJ, and they're the last remaining. Um, they're, they're, st they're still on negative interest rates in the front end. Yeah. In a world where their inflation is not only continually going up, but it's actually accelerating <laughs> in the data. Um, That's crazy. And so, yeah, I mean, 
it's crazy to me because it, 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 when you juxtapose that with where we were during COVID, which was just like, here's bond buying programs. We're buying $120 billion per month. Uh, you had negative interest rate policy priced in the U.S. briefly. That was 2020. But yeah. But still, you went from all this easy money, crazy amount of like everything's going up forever, venture investments trading at ridiculous valuations right. to guys, no, we can't do that. There are issues with just printing money like crazy. <laughs> and obviously, this deleveraging has impacted crypto as well. Yeah. Um, and. You know, that's why, you know, largely speaking, uh, the, the move in interest rates is, is what's caused the role in equities and other risk assets, venture investments, etc. Um, but yeah, that's the main story. And now, you know, in terms of where we're going from here, um, it really depends on what inflation does domestically right. and abroad. Right. Right. There are there's a path towards a, a soft landing in, in the U.S. Um, I think it's it's very feasible. Um you know, and that's kind of what the market is pricing in and what the sort of forecasts that the Fed are, are, are you know, providing, you know, sort of price. They're basically saying unemployment is going to get to 4.7 and like, you know, you're, you're going to see some slowdown in growth, but it's not going to be a collapse. And stocks are trading at, at fine multiples here. Break even inflations are telling you you're going to get to within spitting distance of of the Fed's inflation target. And so the market's like, yeah, soft landing seems feasible and is, is the likely outcome that's being priced. And if you, you know, not to get too granular, but in terms of a hard landing scenario, I think that in my head and in the market's head, which I kind of agree with right now, that's probably like a 20 percent probability. Mm-hmm. Um, wow. You know, maybe 25. 20, 25 percent of a hard landing and the uh, the 75 percent of a soft landing is how the market is currently I, viewing it. Uh, depending on how you look at it. Yeah. Um, the way, you know, I, I think about it is like, like what, what are like the low delta or like the w- what's the implied probability that the S&P goes to like 3300. Right. Or the implied probability that the Fed uh, cuts by, you know, 150 basis points <laughs> or more. Right. Right. So if you look at those those markets and look at those option curves and yep. try to bake bake in like or try to extract out like a probability. Yeah. You know, that's kind of where I'm getting to like twenty percent ish. Wow. Um, that's extremely bullish or, or on the market's view, right? I don't know if it well, is bullish. I mean it's it's optimistic. Let me put it that way. It it, 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 it is optimistic. And you you know, I, there's a lot of uh, People, you know, you get a lot more headlines being like doomsday. This thing's going. Oh man, I, how many people's? Yeah. First of all, there's been the long term ones that were. Yeah. You know, the broken clock has been right twice a day. They've exactly. Been bull- they've been bearish for you know. They missed the entire run up from the last recession until 2021, uh, and then the, all those guys came back, and um, and then you get a whole new class of these yeah. doomsayers. No, absolutely. Right? I mean, you also get the crypt- crypto fudsters. These guys that come out of the woodwork. You know, they're on Twitter. Yeah. They use the the alarm and the asterisks as if they're like a Bloomberg squawker. I, um, I, I got to tell you, I mean. It's a bull market the, the, for bearishness. Yeah, it is a bull market for bearishness. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bull market for FUD. Yeah, it is. You yeah, know? it is. Yeah. And uh, FUD sells. And you're saying the data doesn't really support that level of bear, uh, it does of, not of negativity i mean like the guy that's saying stuff's gonna be fine is not gonna be the guy that you're listening to or like right. clicking the, the article yeah guys things are gonna be okay chill out yeah. like that's not Million a headline clicks. you want to click <laughs> yeah, yeah. uh but it's kind of shaping up that way here that's interesting abroad the story is yeah, rest just, of world oh my god it's so complicated you have like some places in the eurozone with like high teens like low 20s i think inflation Oof. and they have like all these weird risks. It's like, who really wants to buy Italian bonds? I'll tell you, nobody but the ECB. Yeah. Uh, and so it's like, wait, the the guilt market exploded when we like t- took a step back. In Japan, it's like, well, they own fifty percent of like you know, a, a, basically a ton of their asset markets owned by by the BOJ. Mm. And it's like, well, if we start shifting, like, what does that do, right? Yeah. And the problem is you have just such entrenched behavior that still isn't out of the market, right? Like when you were programmed to think bonds only rally and interest rates stay low forever and you do all of your financial planning in that current world, like you're not set up yet. Like if you're a 30-year, like if you're an insurance company that's managing 20, 30-year liabilities and you've been doing it for 20, 30 years and you're just like, oh, it's easy. Just buy long-dated bonds. Well, no, those things are about to 
you know, sell off like like, like crazy, and they're not set right. up for entire it. Entire economies and national economic strategies were based around the, that those assumptions. Absolutely. I yeah. mean, just take the simple bank model. Yeah. Take your deposits, pay you next to nothing, and buy super long dated bonds right. yeah. or like much further out the curve. Now. The, the the liability costs you more than the what you're it's generating crazy. on the assets, and that's like how you get to be insolvent. <laughs> yeah, that's awful. Right, and so we have to. There's still parts of the world that have to go through that that correction, um, and then you throw in sort of the the commodity super cycle that might not super cycle. That's you know <laughs> I don't want to use that. that. Word like lots that... of guys use paradigm shift like crazy. Par like you read about paradigm shifts. That's like that's no, a big statement. That's yeah. a big big statement. But the commodities the uh, commodities can can I think there's a, a risk that you get like further sort of upside in a lot of commodities. A lot of people of, think this. Um, uh, smart people like yeah. like like you have said this. Um, right, even like Zoltan, right, has been talking Zoltan, about the, the big one. The big headline that was at, is uh, Jeffrey Curry at at Goldman. He's there. Um, commodities analysts he was really good early um in the year last year super bullish oil and he was pulling uh, what 43 percent appreciation in commodities, in commodities yeah in 2023 is his prediction that's his prediction um, and you know what there's healthy two-way risk to that prediction but i am inclined to think that that number sounds feasible to me think about this uh, a quarter or a fifth of humanity is about to reopen yeah. there's a good like Literally 1.3 billion people that have been trapped at home in China, in China, yeah, not doing anything and saving money and and working. Are, are they are, really going to reopen though? Haven't it, we heard this? Everything like points that way. It's now, like now, a, now it's like now it is. Yeah, now it's I, I mean it, okay. it, it's happening. Got it. And like once you let the genie out the bottle, like well, I I, I agree. Right, it's like and it, you remember in the U.S. like I when remember. we reopened, it was reopened gangbusters. And they said masks off, and now Mask. it's like nope. There's nothing they could do. I yeah, mean, they, they it's would like have people to like party in the streets. Yeah, like, I mean they would have to really really go hard to actually put us back. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean it would take a lot. I mean think about it. It would literally take like police on the street. Imagine like China. These people were protesting like crazy. They were. they were. And it was hitting the media. And like that's the big risk if you're, you know, in the you know, Communist Party, etc. Um, and so when you have a fifth of humanity about to go crazy after saving and a bunch of money. Buy stuff. Buy stuff, travel, ride cars, goods. goods yeah, like, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's gonna put some upward pressure on commodities, most yep. likely. Yep. Right. And then the question is, OK, well, if oil starts to go crazy again, does inflation in the U.S. come back? <laughs> and then component. it's like, holy shit. It's a big wait. part of the CPI, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. If you're looking at head, I mean, I don't even know why they strip out energy. People spend know. money on gas. Like, <laughs> I care about how much money I spend on Me gas. Me too. Yeah. Right. And it feeds into all the other exactly. goods and stuff. And it's like, yeah, you know. Core CPI. Oh man, so, so nonsense. That, so, so it's this like a is legacy a big, number. This is sort of a big. Uh, um, uh, I don't know what the word is, but like sort of um, question mark. Then how this, how the China reopening actually affects. I mean, you thrown out one right. The commodity uh, upward pressure on commodities prices is one, but also like the ripple effects it could affect the supply chain again. If all of a sudden they need to get a ton of stuff in by boat or out by boat, right? The whole big I mean, question mark for how that impacts twenty three. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but all I know um, for sure is that interest rates are high. And, you know, if you think about it, you're not really taking risk, right? If you go buy a six month T bill and earn four and a half percent, that's four and a half percent that you're making without taking any risk. So the risk to Treasury specifically, right, is a US default. And yeah. So when we say, like, you know, but when you and everyone else says that treasuries are risk-free, it's because what? Has that ever happened? It's, it's really because the Fed can just buy them. Yeah. <laughs> print money. Well, because the risk is so low because yeah. we have our own money printer. Uh, yes, basically. Yeah. Well, it's because the U.S. is the dominant sort right. of monetary right. system in the world. Right. Um, but it's also, if you're worried, you, you don't even have to go that far out in duration. Right. Right? You, like you can a buy a short-dated one. Yeah. And you're not taking any term risk. You'll get right. the money back in six months. And we're just talking about the U.S. credit. If you go up the credit stack of like corporate or, you know, Mini's other, or, yeah, yeah, you know, and you get more yields or like mortgage, like AAA CLOs. It just makes it really hard for getting your returns out of like asset, risk asset appreciation. Yeah. When like, you can put stuff in very low risk stuff that just pays you money. Yeah. That's the, the, the whole the thing The risk that's adjusted happening. returns don't make like investing in like a crazy tech company like that worth it right, right now like right. i just i don't see it 
So how I, long does this last, though? Is it until rates come down, or is it until they stabilize at a level? Like what is? I mean, here here's the thing. I mean, here's the risk to, to the risk assets. The like essentially, the Fed's telling you they're going to go higher for longer, right? And they want to keep rates high. And let's just say the Fed realizes they can keep rates high, and sh- shit's fine. Yeah. People don't go crazy. Unemployment doesn't go crazy. Um, you if know, that happens, come, and they if that happens, it, yeah. right? And what you're sacrificing is really like a little bit of growth up front. Uh, the question is, are you sacrificing like big picture, like long term, huge productivity gains yeah. by having front end rates so high and the cost of money so high for a really long period of time? Right. So Basically, that's like the, we the lo- balance. So you're saying like we lose out on like the investment in new mm-hmm. technologies that will yield huge benefit years in the future. Is that yeah, the idea? I mean, yeah. that's, that's a pretty, pretty a, big thing. That's I mean, a risk. We, the, the reason, like, fundamentally, I was having a debate on the desk about, like, U.S. dominance, right? And, you know, people, why U.S. dominance is going to continue? People can point to, you know, we got nukes, we got aircraft carriers, we have the Federal Reserve, like, the SWIFT system, et cetera. But really, for me, you know what it comes down to? Silicon Valley. We got the best tech, the best brains, and... You know, you pull tons of talent together and, and you build cool stuff mm-hmm. that everyone on the planet uses. Right. Right. That ability to to innovate your way um, into growth and revenues. Right. Like Apple is basically a giant country. <laughs> right. Right. And how did that come about? That comes from a capital like market and capital formation. And that's aided by by low interest rates and right. deeply hindered by high ones. I see. And and that's very interesting, right? And so, like, that's not necessarily how they, the Fed, thinks about it, but that's how I think about that's it. That's a risk. That's, that's a, a risk. risk. It's like who wants to like? And it's not that it goes away, but it's sort of like how much do do we lose a period of time, right? That, while we're not like, if I'm a big mo- money manager, it's like, am I going to throw money into venture, especially in the year, the kind of year that the venture has had this yeah. year? Not nah, sticking bonds. Yeah. Right. Take no risk, and that means like, fewer fewer companies getting founded, fewer entrepreneurs, right? Like l- that's all. growing I mean, more just slowly. Think, think about a, a regular company, Microsoft. They can they always have an investment. Do I invest in research and development, or do I do like, a core thing? Uh, like, do I, do I just no, I return mean, it, money to my shareholders, it, or do I buy my, back my own debt? Like, right. there's so many. And it's hard if you if you um, are looking at that question and you've got, let's say, I forget, Harvard Business School calls it the golden ratio. I forget what it is. Maybe it's 15%. They suggest that, like, every mature company should be investing in R&D, right? And, like, yeah. disrupting themselves. But it's like, you know, if you've got to cut a bunch of money, right, or cut back on your OPEX, like, it looks like something you might not need. A nice to have, perhaps not a need to have. But that... That has a long-term effect, perhaps, on discoveries not being made, new yeah. science not being developed, et cetera. So and that's a really interesting side effect I hadn't thought about of, of high front-end rates. Uh, absolutely. And it's also, I mean, I don't know. I feel like I don't need to learn to code right now. Have you seen this? this thing? <laughs> <laughs> so funny. I haven't seen Is this a meme now that like, you don't need to? Because it used to be like, you know, for from 2010 to 2020, you every to kid yeah, who says, well, what should I major in? You were like. Engineering, yeah, and now I'm like development. Learn how to like use this. Thing. Yeah, I mean, can Chat GPT code for us? It's a good question. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I this. Yes. All right. Well, uh, this has been a fun conversation. A little longer I than I go one. for hours. I know. Honestly, this is. I know, but yeah. we got a bunch of other people to get to. Um, oh, so sure. thank you, Bimnet Abibi from Galaxy Digital Trading, as always, uh, my friend, and have a great uh, holiday and New Year. You too. Christine Kim from Galaxy Research, my friend. Uh, welcome to the show, as always. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm currently in Canada with my parents, and it's been really nice to to see them. How are you, Alex? I am excellent. Uh, today is my last day in New York for several weeks, so I'm excited to get out into the real world uh, where it's not the hustle and bustle um, for the holidays. I'm sure you are, too. Um, so I as I've said to everyone on the show today, uh, this is um, this is our year-end episode. And so, you know, you're among many things an Ethereum researcher, and you've been covering Ethereum doggedly all year. Um, and you've been, you know, so when I tell you, Christine, this is the year-end 2022 show, like, what Woo-hoo. is the big story for Ethereum 
in 2022, this past year, or several stories? You know, what's the big takeaway in your mind? Yeah, I mean, I think that people won't be surprised when I say that the big Ethereum story of 2022 was undoubtedly the success of the merge. It's hard to understate the significance of Ethereum's transition to proof of stake, both in terms of the network's value and history and in terms of the sheer complexity of what the merge did to Ethereum. It overhauled an entire blockchain consensus mechanism while that blockchain was still running and supporting billions of dollars worth of assets on chain. It's an incredible feat that now almost 100 days later is still proving itself as one of Ethereum's most radical and successful upgrades ever. Um, A few major impacts of the merge on Ethereum that's been playing out include, of course, the electricity consumption of the network declining by over 99%, daily issuance of ETH dropping from roughly 15,000 ETH to just under 2,000, block times on Ethereum becoming way more predictable and frequent. Um, And so these were all expected impacts of the merge that now we're seeing indeed as like a reality on the network. Um, So I think very different from what is perhaps like the big story of the broader crypto industry, which is the degradation of trust. The big story of the year for Ethereum, I think is one of success and is one of for cause for celebration. You've done a great job covering the merge. Um, We have a ton of content out there on the merge and Ethereum from Christine. Um, Everyone should check out. You can obviously just go to galaxy.com slash research and click the Ethereum button and see plenty of research there. Um, You know, so when we look about when we think about where we're headed now, um, I feel like the Ethereum story is always a development story because they 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 have been altering and upgrading this thing, you know, every six months for years what do we have to look forward to in 2023 uh, from a development standpoint? I'm really glad that you asked that question because there is so much to look forward to. And if the merge, which had never been done before, this is an indication of just like the, the uh, what do you call it? Like the brink of the iceberg? <laughs> I don't know if that's the right word, but like the tip of the iceberg of like what is possible. Uh, we've got so much upcoming on Ethereum's development roadmap, and it includes things like ZK EVMs, uh, the further development of optimistic rollups in the layer two ecosystem on Ethereum, scalability through dank sharding, um, efforts to continue to reduce the size of Ethereum state um, through state expiry and statelessness. We've got Enshrined PBS as a solution to ongoing issues around MEV um, and so much more. So really, I think there's a lot to get excited about in terms of the progress being made in the crypto space um, to cryptography, to mathematics, to decentralized governance, blockchain scalability, and so forth, that um, even though there's been a lot of embarrassing and frankly, very damning and criminal activity in the crypto space, um, there's a ton of potential and work being done on the technology. And so, um, yeah, I would probably encourage a lot of our listeners um, to think of the merge and think of what's upcoming as reason for why this, why blockchain techni- technology is still has a lot of promising potential and is still worth watching in 2023. Yeah, I think we're going to see a lot more interesting stuff from the Ethereum crowd. Uh, they, they've they definitely pushed the limits on um, a lot of things people didn't think were possible. I mean, I think about ZK. Let's stick on there for a second because you've also done a lot of research on zero knowledge everything. But the ZK EVM being, I think, the 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 part where it really ties right into Ethereum specifically. Um, this is something that basically didn't exist or was even thought pos- perhaps impossible just a few years ago. Um, sort of like generalized computation inside a zero knowledge uh, system. And I think when I I remember at Fidelity, uh, when I was doing blockchain research, you know, we were looking at things, it's a little different, but similar uh, concepts was homomorphic encryption. You could only do addition and subtraction inside uh, this thing. And now now you're talking about running the entire EVM inside a zero knowledge system. And that's really, I mean, you have to give credit like that, that drive to scale Ethereum is what really produced this incredible science now of uh, zero knowledge, uh, all these all these innovations that we see in the zero knowledge space. Um, what what like what's the story with zk and Ethereum? Like, what do you think? Or maybe offer some predictions of 
where ZK and Ethereum go in 2023? Honestly, I think that in 2023, we're going to start to see early implementations of ZK EVMs through pre-alpha test sets, um, very limited functionality, like centralized networks. Um, that use validity proofs that generate these general computations that verify these general computations uh, using ZK. But a lot of it will still be early stages in 2023. I don't imagine that any of these uh, ZK EVMs will be really production ready. I actually expect many of them to break. Like once they are open for uh, more users and initially like the the prover sets, the sequencer sets will all be very permissioned and it'll be baby steps, I think in 2023, but it'll be cool for a greater number of the Ethereum community to start interacting with the technology, getting familiar with it. Um, I actually think that in the, in the meanwhile, there will probably be a lot more development and uh, things to be watching around just the general layer two landscape. Um, as ZK EVM tech is being developed, there will probably be a lot more trust and adoption for the more um, mature and seasoned layer two rollups that have already launched, like um, Arbitrum and Optimism. Um, and I'm really excited to see uh, more decentralization from Optimism and Arbitrum, um, just because they've been around longer and their tech is a lot more ossified. I think it's time in 2023 to start uh, raising the bar higher and holding them accountable to higher decentralization standards. And another big topic that you've covered, Christine, is MEV um, and and this uh, decentralization or centralization of block production on Ethereum. So, where does MEV boost uh, go in 2023, and and in and what does the um, block production censorship? Where does this whole issue uh, land? You know, with censoring relays and stuff like that. Um, what what are your predictions there for the next year? I think that the trend we're seeing now of more relay competition and more builder competition will continue. I think so long as we are in a bear market in 2023 um, and on-chain activity is, is still dampened, um, I think we will see um, a further reduction in the dominance of flashbots. Um, however, I think that no matter how many relays get built, no matter how many new builders um, enter into the fray, as soon as DeFi activity picks up, as soon as, you know, rewards from priority fees, MEV, um, start to increase because of on-chain activity increasing, um, I think we are going to see a reversion back to what is most trusted, which is the Flashbots relay and, um, you know, the use of exclusive order flow to to boost the dominance of certain builders over others. Um, and so I think what we'll see is like we'll see um, decentralization, like diversification, and then as like on-chain activity picks up, markets get better, you know, where we start to move off of a bear market into like a bull, I think we're going to start to see the effects of centralization. Um, and so, you know, on that timeline, who knows where the markets are going to go? Um, developers are currently working on a bunch of different solutions to tackle this issue of builder centralization. Um, None of them, I think, will be particularly ready for uh, 2023, but there'll, there'll be things to be watching in 2023. And that is, of course, like the the efforts to build and shrine PBS, the efforts around Suave, which is Flashbot's solution to decentralized block building. Um, and one last notable one that I think will launch in 2023 is Eigenlayer, which is a protocol to... Um, to impose additional slashing conditions on validators um, and thereby allow them to restake um, their stake ETH. Uh, so I think that protocol and Suave and these the efforts by Ethereum core developers to, to move forward uh, and try and be PBS, I think those solutions will um, make progress in 2023. Christine Kim from Galaxy Research, as always, my friend, thank you so much. Walt Smith, welcome uh, from the Galaxy Research and Trading Teams. Nice to see you. Good to see you, too. So, thank Walt, you. you were one of the primary authors of Galaxy Research's Ready Layer One report, which we released actually about a year ago. Um, and it was called Ready Layer One, Ethereum and its competitors, right? And its smart contract competitors. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
and we looked at what ten L one competitors to ETH. Yep. It's primarily primarily a report about all layer one blockchain networks. Yep. A lot's changed since then. Um, in your mind, sort of, what is the layer one story? You know, X Bitcoin of twenty twenty two. Yeah, I think that I think that's a that's a great place to start. I mean, we I remember we talked about twelve months ago, probably a little bit before that too, just how everything was kind of like a fork of Geth. Like everything is based off of the EVM. If you want general um, computation, if you want smart contracts, you kind of have to use the existing development tooling. You want to be able to like test your code. You want to be able to like have some securities and like have it be audited. So you're going to write it in Solidity. It's going to be um, it's going to be the EVM, but that's kind of like broken down. I think um, early on the EVM was like really commoditizable and you could copy and paste it and make it faster and the market demanded that. But kind of like the microstructure on um, all these chains has kind of broken down. So now it's like, okay, what's the most durable asset? Like what has the most durable network? And I think going forward, we're going to see this even more, like how you differentiate your chain um, technologically is going to matter more in a bear market. And for ETH, especially like a few upgrades that are supposed to come out in 2023 are going to make the EVM um, incompatible to be like the new fork is going to be incompatible with the EVMs or the geth that's on a couple other L1s. So it's not going to really be like you could substitute this EVM for this EVM anymore. So block space is going to kind of become... Um, having a, a, a new premium, I think, and that's kind of something we've seen play out. We've seen that play out with a few other chains. Yeah. What other chains? Um, well, we've talked about like uh, Solana, AVAX, and Luna. Um, Sol Luna, AVAX. <laughs> yeah. This was the all L1 trade of last fall. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And I think um, Solana's VM is very different. Sea level is um, really performative, and it takes a, a much stronger node to run. But the tooling around it has gotten a lot better. Uh, developers struggled early on writing on there, but um, people are now like forking Sea level, putting it on rollup. So I think you know you're starting to see um, chains that are really distinct at every layer start to have their own ecosystems and maybe their own network effect and be able to pull away from just the EVM. But again, like the existing chains that just forked Geth and just right. were faster, you know, it's kind of like, where do you go from here? Like you were just copying the developers. You can't copy them anymore. The new upgrade is going to be incompatible. So as far as like Solana goes, I think, you know, it, ha it has kind of a branding issue right now with from some of the fallout from the last month's events. But I think... Um, it still has jump building like great clients, um, diversifying like what the software the validators are running, making it faster. Mm -hmm. um, Luna is actually like kind of rebranded and has like the best documentation and it's the only open source uh, permissionless like Cosmos chain. So basically that means you can, you know, if you want to launch a dApp, you can just launch it instantly. On a lot of other Cosmos chains, it's kind of like whitelisting. Like you have to get permission from the chain to launch an application. Interesting. So because Terra had all this documentation, because it has, um, because it's open, like a lot of developers are still there. So I think, I, you know, that economy is pretty much dead. It, it, and branding wise, I don't think it'll ever come back. <laughs> That's hard to get a narrative around decentralized money. Um, right. <laughs> but I hear you. As far as other ones go, I don't know. What well, no, I mean, I guess what I'm hearing is interesting, right? We were in this phase where, like, it was sort of a, a, any EVM chain could launch. It could, it could yeah. be a side chain. It could be, a, just like you said, a yeah. slight tweak. Yeah. And everyone said, oh, my gosh, like, there's all this EVM block space you could build anywhere. And it was sort of interchangeable. And there were bridges. Yeah. Um, and you're, in addition to that fork capability uh, being reduced by future Ethereum upgrades, if not totally bricked, yeah. Um, you're saying people are going to start really gravitating instead towards like the the the, the durable chain itself. Yeah, right? and and so like on Ethereum, we're going to have all these rollups or whatever, and we're going to get EIPs that make rollups even better and easier and cheaper. And you think that's where that goes uh, going forward? Instead of like all the block space being across chain, like if more block space is needed, it happens at layers. Yeah, I think that's a good a good way of um, kind of looking at it. I think in a bull market, it's kind of easy to swallow. Um, like downtime or really high inflation rates in a bear market, you're kind of like, what's going to save my cash for the next run? Mm -hmm. um, so at least from like a holder's perspective, I think I think that's the right way of looking at it. As far as rollups go, I mean, TVL and Optimism and Arbitrum is higher than a lot of 
the L1s that had, you know, billion dollar valuations during that were just geth forks a little bit faster. You know, some optimizations don't want to like disparage all the developers working sure. at every protocol, but ultimately <laughs> like you probably had like four, maybe five chains that were worth like billions and billions of dollars that were really just forks of geth. So, you know, now that geth is not necessarily like reforkable. I guess is how you could put it. You are going to see like this distinction, I think, between like Solana has kind of this moat around sea level. Cosmos arguably has a moat with like um, its tech stack, which is like very, very different than all the other ones. Um, now, you could see something like a new chain come in that optimizes in a different way, possibly. Right. Like we talked about Aptos and SWE. Exactly. Some people think those are like the, you know, it's a different language, it's a sort of different design, and that maybe there's a space in the tech differentiation landscape for them yeah um but i but i i i'm not saying there is i think yeah. that's when you look at the space right you think of these i like the way i i hope other people are thinking about it like the way we are which is that you've got you know you've got the evm and ethereum's is going to be reassert its primacy there yeah yeah that's, that's a good way of putting <laughs> right it, yeah. and and then you've got like solana with its with sea level and you're saying you've got cosmos with cosmwasm and everything else that tendermint gives yeah and you're saying there could be room for yeah. something else, but it's really going to have to be differentiated, not just a clone. Yeah, I think so. I, I think the market, um, especially just like what's going on in traditional markets, which um, you guys talk about on the pod all the time, I think, mm -hmm. um, it's it's kind of hard to get something to have momentum right now. So it really needs to stand out from a tech perspective. And I think, again, like Solana really fast did that in certain ways. And maybe it's not Solana, maybe it's just, you know, the VM, C-level, maybe someone figures out a way to put proof of history and make um, yeah. ETH's consensus a lot faster. But, like, right now, it's really about the developers, it's really about um, what's going on in that market, less so than the price action of all L1s. Because there's not this, like, huge ball of money just kind of, like, flying <laughs> around, chasing narratives, chasing totally. the latest fork. Walt Smith, Galaxy Research, uh, great to have you. Charles Yu from Galaxy Research, welcome back to the show, my friend. Hey, AT, good to be back. Let's go. So, Chuck, you follow a lot of stuff and and produce a lot of great uh, research for Galaxy, but two things I wanted to talk with you about today as we sort of look back at 22 and go into 23 are stable coins and then, you know, layered scaling, really primarily roll-ups. But let's start with stables. Um, you know, it's been a... <laughs> It's, it's been an interesting one this year for stables, obviously, given, you know, the algo stables that that failed, but also sort of shifts in the stablecoin landscape. From your perspective, what are the big stories in stablecoins in 22? Yeah, so um, I think, of course, at the top of everyone's mind is uh, a certain algorithmic stablecoin that, um, you know, had a spectacular rise and collapse. Um, but, you know, after that, uh, they were making like this big pitch for the decentralized economy and needs decentralized money. And to be honest, I still think that um, that MO still stands. Um, but in the meantime, what we've seen in the wake of, of, of Terra's collapse is um, a rush towards sort of uh, perceived to be safer stable coins. Um, and these are names like USDC, which benefited at the expense of, uh, of Tether, USDT. Um, you know, we've seen Tether FUD um, trending back and forth like every other month. Um, really, just every time the market collapses, like you see, uh, you see this renowned interest in um, and bringing bringing up more like Tether uh, uh, criticisms um, back to the forefront. And then, you know, we also saw BUSD, which is issued by Paxos, the Binance stablecoin, um, a pretty big rise for BUSD also this year. Yeah, 100%. Um, BSD is one of uh, the few stable coins issued by an entity that's regulated by the NYDFS, Paxos. Um, I think a lot of people typically mistake the two. Um, they assume that because it's marketed as Binance USD, that it's inherently riskier than um, certain other stable coins. Um, but to be honest, because it's issued by Paxos, it's regulated by one of the most um, strict and stringent uh, regulators out there. Um, so, yeah, uh, definitely do think it's valid that that they've uh, 
become a lot more prominent this year. So do you think there'll be a further flight to U.S. regulated stable coins, you know, the the circle, the, the USDCs and the, I guess the BUSDs uh, in 23? Or do you think Tether maintains, uh, you know, it's pretty important and big place in the in the space? Yeah, well, I think it really depends on where all the trading volumes are for um, crypto in general. Like if you expect them to be on centralized exchanges, then 100% I expect them to be in these centralized stable coins um, like USDC, like BUSD. Um, but as you move further out into to DeFi, um, into the decentralized economy, then we're going to be a lot more reliant on more, I guess, decentralized forms of money. Um, I guess more crypto native stable coins out there. And wh- like which that. ones are out there now? Uh, you know, obviously MakerDAO is still in, in existence. I kind of think of it a little bit as like a on-chain hedge fund now because they do all these random weird like ch- trades, many of them off-chain. Um, but what else is out there in terms of the, you know, decentralized stable coins now that Terra is not there? Yeah. So you got coins like DAI, um, Frax, MIM, um, yeah, but there are algorithmic stable coins or so-called algorithmic um, names like, uh, you know, USDD uh, issued on Tron. Um, and then there's a bunch of other like platform native or platform preferred stable coins like um, issued by Team Kujira on Polkadot, um, USDN on Waves or or USN on Near. So that's an interesting um that's an interesting development, I guess, this platform native stable coins. Um, it's going to be a really interesting thing. I think the stable coins currently are about 17% of the total crypto market cap. Um, you know, if we go use the like, you know, coin market cap or coin get go, just summing all of these ones, which obviously, you know, isn't the best way to do it. But even on a volume weighted basis, these are pretty important in crypto. I guess it'll be really interesting to see if they become very important outside crypto uh, one day. I think a lot of people expect them to. Um, and whether these yeah. are those, if, if they do, and it's Tether or Circle, I think people will, um, the people might be kind of surprised if that's the case and not say some like crypto, some, sorry, traditional finance issued or government, even CBDC. Yeah, 100%. Like can, they, um, can these cross the Rubicon from crypto to traditional if, if that happens? I mean, absolutely. Like stable coins, like, to begin with, like even before all the stablecoin dynamics that we've seen today, um, stablecoins were the tool that bridged the traditional and the crypto world together. And to be honest, like I've kind of gone back and forth on on Maker and Dai with their whole positioning within the crypto space, um, namely that you know this was the premier decentralized stablecoin out there. Um, but when I think about their real world initiative, real world asset initiatives. Um, basically lock in real world financial assets like real estate, corporate or government bonds um, to help balance the duration of assets against liabilities. Um, You know, this comes at the expense of decentralization and trust minimization. Um, But as I kind of think about it, like, like you've been saying, like real world assets kind of have this important task of expanding crypto to to the mainstream and can really strengthen the ties between the normal traditional world um, with crypto or Web3. And so, um, yeah, I think one of the most important developments that we've seen come out of this is uh, the reignition of the DAI savings rate. Um, you know, crypto is really missing a savings tool that uh, pays a non-zero yield on stablecoin holdings. Um, and throughout this whole time, crypto has been pitched as a tool that provides competitive rates against traditional savings accounts. And we can see that starting to take hold as um, as Dai delivers on this this Dai savings rate, um, so yeah. But in my opinion, what like Maker really should do, <laughs> what Maker really should do is commit to going down this route and to let an alternative stablecoin go for the fully decentralized um, right. money title. Whereas right now they're sort of they've got the end game plan, which is sort of back on the decentralization spectrum. But on the other hand, they've got these this real world assets team, and they've got the deals with like Coinbase and others to invest their money right they're sort of trying still to live in both worlds um but they've got to commit to one um yeah 100 percent. okay let's let's transition uh chuck you've talked a lot uh and done a lot of research on roll-ups um which you know i think most people believe you know particularly of the zk variety but for now of the optimistic variety 
uh, believe is sort of the future of layered scaling. Um, you know, no longer say uh, payment uh, channels or or other attempts, uh, but that people are and there are two in particular that have a lot of TVL, right? Optimism and Arbitrum on uh, and a lot of activity. W what's your take on on roll up so far this year? Or maybe those two specifically? Are, am I right? Are those the two that matter right now? Yeah, absolutely. And, do, um, and they do my, matter? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 100%. In my opinion, rollups are kind of like stable coins because um, they make Ethereum usable. Like Just like stable coins make trading, DeFi, payments on blockchains more usable, um, rollups are the solution that kind of bring crypto to the masses um, in a usable and digestible manner. Um, and I would say that they've been one of the few bright spots in crypto, especially over the second half of this year. Um, and this really kicked off with, with Optimism launching their airdrop um, towards the end of May. You know, we saw about 250,000 eligible addresses, like, um, uh, I guess, qualify for this airdrop. And, um, you know, the average size of the airdrop came in at like 800 OP tokens, which um, was trading around like a dollar to a dollar fifty, so a pretty sizable airdrop that got a lot of people hyped about, um, you know, using rollups and blockchains in general. Um, and this hype obviously translated to Arbitrum, especially as they kicked off their own um, Project Galaxy um, incentive campaign in June, and we saw that all this hype had kind of translated into um, a congestion on the on the blockchain that that made things sort of unusable. Um, so they took a pause in that whole campaign until the launch of a more usable <laughs> um, blockchain. And, and and we're supposed to get some upgrades uh, on Ethereum, uh, supposedly, that will make rollups even easier and cheaper. Um, right? Do you think that do you think we'll see just it, a lot more growth in the use of rollups over the L1 chain in 2023? Yeah, I think that's where all the new growth is going to happen, um, especially as they form all these new, you know, integrations with uh, different centralized exchanges like um, direct withdrawals from Coinbase to Arbitrum to Optimism. Like that's going to be huge. Yeah, that um, makes it a lot easier for, for regular folks not having to bridge or anything like that. Yeah, right. So avoiding bridging all together, um, getting all that potentially through your wallet, through your MetaMask. Um, and, you know, one of the big criticisms that I've had about, um, well, ZK rollups in general is just that, um, they tend to sort of like forward sell themselves. Um, like, you know, I've been hearing the same pitch from them, like for the past three years. And at this point, I'm really no longer holding my breath. Um, but you know, one of my main criticisms of ZK rollups, um, was just that like, they need to scale up tremendously. They need to see a ton of usage because for they actually become more economical to use, especially against like optimistic rollups. And so the longer that they take to, to really roll out to develop over time, um, although we are seeing a ton of uh, promising potential uses um, through ZK EVM chains, um, I think it's gonna be a, quite some time before we see ZK rollups um, really take over. In the meantime, we've got the optimistic variety, and they are being used. They're growing. Um, so very interesting stuff. Um, still wondering if we can ever see rollups on Bitcoin. Uh, we've talked about that before on the podcast. Um, some changes would need to be made. So I'm not holding my breath for that either. But in the meantime, lots of interesting scaling work happening across the whole ecosystem. Um, that's it. Charles Yu, Galaxy Research. Thank you, my friend. Saul Kadir from Galaxy Research. Welcome. How's it going, Alex? It's good, my friend. Um, so again, we're doing this sort of a uh, little bit of a retrospective. And I think, you know, one of the things that you cover um, quite closely are NFTs. And of course, NFTs had a huge, you know, 18 months. Um, yeah. But when you step back and think about the last year, you know, what are the big stories or what is, where are we now in NFT world? Yeah, it, it's a great question. Um, I think maybe the the best way to go about this is we can kind of just walk through the big stories, the big things that happened this year. And so if we rewind the clock, um, let's start with, with the, the earlier in this year. Uh, the big story was we were still kind of riding this high from the bull market. 
and uh, Looksware comes out and it's kind of like the first marketplace to at scale test this idea of incentivizing people to trade with the token, with the Looks token. And they kind of set the world on fire. They were probably the first real challenger to OpenSea. Tons of people were using it. Uh, certainly a lot of wash trading was happening there, but they proved the concept. Um, and then fast forward a couple months, you know, the big consolidation piece happened. Yuga Labs picked up CryptoPunks and MeBits. They seemed unstoppable at that point, and they rode that momentum into the other side mint, which in my view for this past year was the absolute peak of NFT mania. Uh, this is when volumes were the highest. This is when uh, Yuga Labs, they raised half a billion dollars, $550 million from that one mint from selling 55,000 plots of land at an average cost of $5,000. Um, people were spending so much ETH to jump the queue for the mempool that in some cases they're actually spending more in gas than the actual cost of the the plot wow it's just just insane um and you know board apes themselves the floor price was half a million dollars at that point that was like the all-time high for for board apes um it's that was crazy absolutely what was that you said that was april so this is like the very end of april the very beginning of may it was like that last weekend um, and then even on the Solana side of NFTs, you know, D gods were pumping pretty hard. Um, everybody was pretty happy. <laughs> now we get into kind of like the beginning of the bear market, so to speak. Um, and certainly NFTs were no exception. You know, volumes started to go down as the token prices went down and Axie and step in, uh, those kind of hit the perfect storm of having really high issuance of the NFTs and hitting the bear market. So they, both of those collapsed. Um, and we start skating into this kind of like cooler market uh, bear cycle for NFTs. But still, like in the summer, a lot of innovation happening. We see the birth of the first real uh, AMM for NFT trading, PseudoSwap. And that model then got copied by some players on Solana. Um, and you know, JPEG came out in the summer. That was kind of a lending protocol that had a stable coin associated with it. So we're seeing some financialization use cases heat up. Um, and then as we skate into the fall, the big story then becomes, oh, you know, there's these protocols like Pseudoswap, which don't pay any royalties and which are way cheaper. It's only half a percent versus 2.5% for the platform fee. Uh, so, so folks started to realize maybe we don't need to pay royalties at all. And that became the big question. And huge pendulum swinging. Uh, Magic Eden originally had this concept of a, like an enforceable royalty standard that they then pulled back. Then they went zero royalty um, in order to pre protect market share. That's kind of what this question really boiled down to is, do I care more about market share? Or do we care more about the ethos of giving creators royalties on recurring sales? Um, and that is still an issue that's being debated and being tested today. You know, OpenSea has reacted with their own standard, which is kind of a multi-sig with other big players that does enforce royalties. Um, but even still, like Blur, for instance, has kind of a, a flexible approach to royalties. And if you look at the data, most of the trades on Blur are not necessarily paying royalties. But again, the data that I'm citing, uh, it, it's in contention. Uh, it's this influencer, uh, nftstats.eth, and they've come out in retaliation to what he was saying about how Blur doesn't enforce royalties. And, and said the data is wrong or something. They've contested yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's still kind of like a, it's a hot issue. Um, and that, that kind of actually segues into like the last two, I think, big stores of the year, which are marketplaces are innovating. A Blur kind of came out of nowhere when in fact they've been building this trading oriented marketplace for a year now very hyper optimized ui for just trading use cases that borrows a lot of principles from aggregators uh one of which or both of which the big ones gem and genie got acquired this earlier this year by uniswap and, and OpenSea. and then and then finally i think the the last kind of big story is we're seeing uh, a ton of activity happening on polygon it started with reddit when that kind of set the world on fire with those uh, PFP uh, Reddit avatars, and some of them were hitting $20,000 USD floor. Uh, Starbucks started their Odyssey pilot. And then most recently, we saw uh, the former president, Donald Trump, issue a 45000 uh, collection on Polygon. Um, 
to, so now if you look at the data, uh, Polygon NFTs are oftentimes breaking to the top 10 in terms of volume and really competing with uh, the, the top two, which are ETH and Solana. So it's been very interesting to watch all of that. Yeah, the the Trump collectible cards, uh, I think, was a very funny moment, um, which was just last week. Um, and the whole yeah. the whole thing minted out forty five thousand, one of the bigger collections, I would say, right? Most are ten thousand or less. Yeah, um, definitely. and the floor, the current floor price is at least three x the sale, the initial sale price. Um, that's right. That's right. And it's the former president. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they made um, now now whether or not he is making this money or you know they on the website it says he licensed his likeness to a, another company, but that other company no one's ever heard of. Um, so yeah. easily, you know, NFT Int LLC or something. So right. you know whether or not he's getting the the money directly, or whether he was paid up front for his likeness, and this other company now gets the money. Regardless of that, they made four point four million in the first twenty four hours in primary sales, and at least one hundred and fifty k in the first twenty four hours on the secondaries. Yeah. Um, pretty pretty amazing, to be honest. Yeah, I'm surprised it did so much. I don't know. I, I'm surprised it sold out so quickly. I mean, it only took hours, and it's a big collection to sell out. Um, so. Um, just real quick then, I mean, you know, where do we go? You know, NFTs are at like, I mean, basically volumes we haven't seen since before the bull market. There's they're, the trade volumes yeah. on these Ethereum marketplaces, uh, Ethereum-based, you know, marketplaces. Um, you know, do they come back? I mean, there's, wh wh what's your like sort of 2023 outlook just generally? Yeah, there, there's, I think, a few, few trends that I'm paying attention to. Um, and so one you already brought up is this marketplaces. They're still pretty healthy in terms of just protocol revenue. They're one of the few dApps that actually consistently generates revenue, even in a bear market. Um, and so I think they'll be, they'll, they'll weather the storm. And I think we'll see more innovation happening. Um, the kind of ideas like the unbundling of OpenSea in some ways, we might see specific marketplaces start to gain traction over time. And also just paying attention to like what Uniswap is doing and almost marrying the DeFi side with the NFT side in one in one place. I think that'll be really interesting to watch. Um, and then some other trends I'm paying attention to are, let's not sleep on Yuga Labs. I mean, they just hired a uh, very senior executive at Blizzard to, to run point at Yuga Labs, uh, specifically because they're kind of doubling down on the other side vision which is the tech demos have been very impressive. I think it'll get released in 2023 and it might move the needle uh, for that whole ecosystem. But it's important to remember, I think it's compatible with any NFT collection. So it might just bring a lot of people into the fold, so to speak, uh, regardless of whether you need a Yugo Labs NFT or ApeCoin or anything like that. I just think uh, that product will be interesting just to watch as it's bringing a lot of people together and it's basically a game right i mean that's that's the idea yeah, yeah. it's like an open world game everyone loves it supports everyone loves open world video games <laughs> yeah yeah and, and it has proximity chat it, it can support thousands of concurrent players uh, this is pretty cutting edge technology i don't think a, a blizzard exec would go there without really understanding the long-term vision um and then, and then finally kind of the last theme i'm paying attention to is the idea of uh, dynamic NFTs, uh, we saw earlier experiments experiments in this with the likes of Backpack and X NFT standards. I think wallets will play like such a central role here where you can have entire applications housed inside the NFT itself, have everything happen on chain and, and the wallet being that uh, ultimate destination where most of the activity is happening. That seems to be like a trend that will continue to pick up steam in 2023. Um, maybe not necessarily has gone mainstream then, but I think a lot of builders are focusing on that and it seems to be a very promising avenue. Interesting. I, I have basically no idea what that means. So we will have you back, of course, and you will explain <laughs> it to us in the new year. Uh, Saul Kadir from Galaxy Research. Thank you so much. Tyler Williams, Galaxy's uh, head of public policy, regulatory affairs. Welcome. Uh, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Alex. Always a pleasure. So um, a lot has happened in crypto, obviously, but a lot of has happened in Washington as it relates to crypto in 2022. Either take a step back or as you think about this year, which is coming to a close, like what is the big story uh, in Washington when it, when it comes to policy and digital assets? Yeah, what well, I, I would say if I were doing a retrospective, which you know nicely coincides with when I joined Galaxy. So I started Galaxy in February of this year. So a lot has happened. It's been a busy 
a been year. 11 months. It's been 11 months. Um, when, when I think about where we were last year and sort of moving into the early start of this year, last year we were coming on sort of the, the heels of the infrastructure debate in Washington and the broker fix, and that was when the crypto community really got engaged in Washington. They were very upset about the rules and the definitions that were being debated. And there was an onslaught from the community calling on their elected officials, trying to change things in Washington. And I think that's when people really got engaged and said, if we want to be a part of this debate, we have to hire people in D.C. We have to spend money uh, trying to affect the communications and educating people. And that's when the sort of education cycle began. So if, if you think that that started in early parts of 2022, then I think we've come quite a long way in terms of advancing thoughtful pieces of legislation. We've seen major packages come forth in a bipartisan way between Senators Lummis and Gillibrand. Uh, we've seen the Digital Commodity uh, Consumer Protection Act, the DCCPA. We've seen a number of other pieces of legislation, whether it's um, ranking member McHenry and Chairwoman uh, Waters working on their uh, stablecoin legislation. So we've seen a lot that's happened in a positive, progressive manner for the industry. But if you table all of that, <laughs> and then you add in the, the blow-ups and the things that have happened in the space, whether it's Celsius, Three Arrows, whether it's Luna, whatever it might be. FTX. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, we're going to get to that in okay. a minute. <laughs> so if you layer that in, it's, it's affected the industry in their ability to project credibility to policymakers. And so there is, there, it's a necessity to do some rehabilitation. And then it, when you layer on the FTX saga, because of how deep it penetrated and permeated Washington in the policy circles, in the political circles, um, it is people are still trying to wrap their heads around how to proceed moving forward and whether or not they need to re-underwrite uh, their belief system relative to the space. So we're seeing that quite a bit right now, and I think we'll see it uh, in in a little bit more in the early part of this year, but I, I'm hopeful that policymakers are recognizing the necessity to solve big picture issues like how to regulate a dollar-backed stablecoin, how to solve the market structure issues because we need to know and have we need to have better rules of the road for what assets are or are not securities. People know that these are issues, and I think that they're they're becoming more cognizant that if they don't do something. It's going to continue to proliferate in other markets, which is exactly what ties back into what we've seen in some of the blowups. So that's where I think we are. That's where I think we're going. Yeah. And I'm hopeful that this next year is going to be a more serious attempt to actually just solve a problem and work towards a point of execution, meaning getting something done from a regulatory or legislative path in, in a narrow way. What do you think is the most likely... Uh if you had to bet, the first bill uh, that comes out and is introduced, uh, is it positive or negative, first of all, <laughs> in, in the new Congress? Well, I, I mean, I think you're going to see whenever a new Congress rolls over, all of the bills from the previous cycle sort of go into file number nine and they have to get reintroduced. Yeah. So I think we'll see the playbook is to reintroduce a lot of the things that have previously been done, whether it's the stablecoin legislation, uh, whether or not it's uh, the Lummis drill brand package. CCPA, so I think we'll yeah. see a bunch of those so coming out. they'll all be reintroduced to yeah, get think, them back into the new Congress. I think they'll all be, a lot of them will be reintroduced. So there's going to be tweaks and sure. you know things uh, that happen Prim around the primarily, edges. Primarily uh, the House bills probably, right? Because if, if the House flips to the house has flipped to republican control then some of that stuff might be reintroduced with slightly different stuff but i mean if the senate is unchanged you think there'll be major changes to dccpa or or i, I would Brand? i would imagine that there'll be uh change substantive changes to all of these big picture bills just because uh you know, policymakers, it's an evolving process and you learn more as yeah. days go on. So there's always going to be tweaks. And I, I would imagine that they would reintroduce those things and there would be substantive changes and they would try to advance those in some capacity. And do you think, um, you know, we have, for example, seen a bipartisan bill that was negative uh, from Senators Warren and Marshall? Um, I, I say negative, but I would say, um, you know, restrictive. It actually has things that are totally impossible to enforce. Um, let alone bad, right, in it. But do you think we're going to see more movement on 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 uh, industry, we'll call it progressive regulation for industry, 
or regressive regulation for industry? Like, do you think the are the scales going to tip positive or negative uh, if for there, the crypto industry? Do you think if we get to a point, or is that of, the wrong way to think? About I think that's the wrong way to think about. It. Yeah, if we get to a point of execution. Uh, meaning that a bill is going to the president's desk for signature or, you know, the market regulators are doing some specific thing or hypothetically like the OCC is going to uh, release a way for fiat backed stable coins to be regulated under our existing uh, banking laws. Like if we're if we're in that point, uh, it's going to be some mix of good and bad. Yeah. But I think that's like the best that we can hope for <laughs> is that in, in a moment where we have something that's positive, we have to accept some of the negative. Right. It's the art of the possible. Yeah. It's not, like not the art don't of let the perfect. the perfect be the enemy of the good. Tyler Williams, head of public policy at Galaxy Digital. Great to see you, my friend. Good to see you. That's it for this episode of Galaxy Brains. Thanks to all our guests and uh, the really interesting points and comments they made. Um, and thank you to our listeners. This is our 41st episode of Galaxy Brains, and it is our last main episode of the year. Um, and I really appreciate all the feedback um, that everyone has given us, and I love that you spend some time with us every week. If you listen and you don't subscribe, you definitely should um, on whatever platform is your preference. But truly, thank you for listening and joining us every week. It means a lot to us. Um, and thank you to our entire team, um, our producers, our, our team at Galaxy that helps us coordinate this, all the members of the research team that make me a lot smarter person than I otherwise would be. Um, and again, thank you so much for listening. Have a safe and happy holiday break and new year. Thanks for listening to Galaxy Brains, the weekly podcast from Galaxy Research. If you enjoy the show, please like, rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. To follow Galaxy Research, sign up for our weekly newsletter at gdr.email, read our content at galaxy.com research, and follow us on Twitter at glxyresearch. See you next week.